we tend to focus on function and coping without really functioning, focusing on how to manage these underlying problems, which are the things that generate the, the loss of function. And so while it's certainly important to think about function, it's also important to think about the precursors of function and how to do this. Unfortunately, we, we, we basically lack an appropriate primary care system in which to do this. The primary care system that we have, the medical system around the world, is basically based on, again, an anachronistic model. It's based on a fee-for-service encounter model in which clinicians are expected to see people eyeball to eyeball and to interact with them, and that, either directly or indirectly, generates their income. This, that model doesn't work in a world of chronic disease. In a world of chronic disease, the issue really has more to do with investment. It has to do with developing these comprehensive analyses and then dealing with the problems, identifying what, what is going on with these individuals, tracking their condition, not seeing them by return of appointment, but rather seeing them when their situation changes. And that requires some kind of a monitoring system that allows you to, to see how people are doing without having to see the people directly. And this, of course, ushers in the whole era of you know, the use of information technology where we need to go in order to, to totally redo this system. Just think about what would happen if we did away with the principle of return appointments. Two-thirds of all the primary care in this country is generated by return appointments. Doctor sees a patient, spends all 12 minutes doing it, and then comes to this momentous calculation that you should come back and see me in six weeks, six months, whatever it is. He's, he's calculated the whole clinical trajectory of this patient. He knows exactly when the next appropriate time to see him. I mean, this is an act of medical hubris beyond anything we know. That's worse than a surgery. <laughs> what would happen if instead of doing that, we said, OK, this is your problem. Here are the two parameters we're going to follow for this problem. I want to collect this information. And when your situation changes, when the trajectory of your illness differs from what we expect the trajectory to be, that's when I want to see you. Imagine how we could reuse the resources that we're currently expending in this rather foolish pursuit. Because what's the first question the doctor asks when the patient comes back to their return appointment? Now, why are you here today? <laughs> so we need to think about a way of changing our practice to what I would call proactive primary care from, from the extent primary care that we have. The other problem we have is that we have for a long time, and it's well, I mean, geriatrics certainly built on this kind of concept, we have a, a need to coordinate medical and social care. We right now work off two very different intellectual frameworks, medicine and social care. The social framework, which is actually the framework that easy care uses, ironically, that was developed by a physician. The, the, the framework that they use is to go in and do a comprehensive assessment and identify deficiencies and then build a compensatory system to basically fill in the gaps that were identified by this deficiency detector. And they declare success when they filled in the gaps. As long as they haven't done any real harm, that, that's considered a success. The medical system is much more driven by outcomes. They want to actually see change in, in, in effect. And, and until we can bring these two together, there are things to learn from both sides. To think about you know, a, a more unified approach, we're always going to have this problem. You know, this has been the historic failure of case management because they work off a different paradigm and independently of where the medical care system is going. Caregiving is, I don't need to tell you, the backbone of this care. Um, I'm always fascinated how you know, in, in my country people worry about our sort of quasi-welfare program called Medicaid, and what would happen if you know, we had to increase it by 2%. But since 90% of all the care is provided by informal caregivers, what would happen if the informal caregiving system disappeared? We'd have a, a, a catastrophe. And so we really need to start thinking from a social policy standpoint about how we build up this caregiving system, both the, the unpaid system and the paid system. And one of the harsh realities of caregiving is that it really relies on exploitation. We
We exploit, we usually immigrants to provide the care and pay system, and we exploit family members to provide the care and pay system. And we need to at least recognize that exploitation and try and think about ways to make that care better and more satisfying for the caregivers, as well as the, the people who are receiving it. This is going to be made worse, of course, by the demographic and social pressures. Um, we, we see aging as a phenomenon all around the world. It's a particularly fascinating phenomenon in parts of Africa, obviously, that have been affected severely by things like AIDS. Um, and now you see this, it, it, it's the same demographic picture that you saw in World War II in Europe. There was this huge big hole, in this case usually the males, in the, in the, in the, in the soldier age. Well, now you see the same big gap on both sides. Um, you know, the, the stress is that we're missing a generation. And as the population ages, and one's going to worry about who's going to get around to provide that care. We're going to skip this generation. We have grandparents take care of grandchildren. Hopefully, grandchildren will be taking care of their grandparents. But they'll also be raising their own families and doing a whole bunch of other things. So we need to recognize that there are going to be enormous demographic and social pressures going on. So we need to develop caregiver-friendly policy. We need to think about what can we do to invest in this huge reservoir of absolutely necessary part of the caregiving system to begin to do that. And one of the things that we, we can exploit here is the role of technology. And I mean primarily, uh, there are some people who are looking forward to a future robotics. Um, and I suppose that's probably possible. Can't quite imagine that, but I suppose it's possible. Um, I was fascinated <coughs> some years ago. I don't know if you saw that the, the, the Japanese invented this human washing machine. And they take an old person, put it in this machine, it's like a washer, its head stuck out the top. You sort of rinse them up and. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's probably room for thinking, I guess in this case, in the box, not out of the box. <laughs> But I think that the technology that I have in mind, at least, is largely information-driven technology. And, and I, I believe that we are on the verge of what I would call cognitive transplantation. I think we, we have too long relied on training. We've too long relied on education. We have the, the image of sort of you know, ed education as an immunization. We train somebody up, and then we send them out into the world. It turns out that most of what we train them for doesn't work in the real world. We feel like we immunize them against the vicissitudes of, of the world. And what we really want to do is, is to provide a way of getting the, the best thinking available to people on the ground at the time they need it. And it is possible now to develop systems that will allow you to do very sophisticated supervision of fairly untrained people if you give them a cognitive infrastructure that's driven by IT uh, in order to do that. We have a major image problem, certainly in my country and around the world, uh, with regard to long-term care. Um, basically, long-term care is seen as one of these services that's socially necessary, but not very exciting. Um, I typically compare it to garbage collection. Uh, everybody recognizes that it's a socially necessary thing to do. I've never found a politician's campaign on the basis of that you know, getting a bit of town dump. And I think, you know, we, we need to begin to think about, you know, if we're going to really encourage major social and political investment in long-term care, then we need to think about how we move from this emphasis on simply saving money to providing better care. And essentially, we, we need to begin to recognize that nobody's going to be anxious to invest in this unless they truly believe that that care makes a real difference. And so we're going to need measures to show that, that, that what, really, what, what that care really leads to. I think most of us who've been there, and certainly the poignant stories you've been hearing, point to the fact that good care does make a difference. But we don't have the capacity yet to demonstrate that difference. I think we're also, I've been mean, very intrigued by this uh, concept that comes out of the business world uh, by a professor at Harvard called disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation really suggests that new technologies that emerge will supplant existing systems if 
the new technologies are cheaper and easier to use. Now think about what the implications of that are for long-term care. We, we, we have created this huge bureaucratic complex infrastructure with all of the, the, you know, the, 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 the work that goes into it. And what we're going to need to think about is how can we make it cheaper, easier, more convenient for consumers to use. And I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity here to begin to think about how to do those things. So what is my research agenda? Well, um, it's fairly simple. Um, it's probably worth a Nobel Prize to pull it off. Um, the, the, the first thing we need to do is we need to really understand much more about multimorbidity. What it is, how to measure it, how it really works. We've jumped ahead to look at the end result of multimorbidity, which is function or dysfunction. But we really don't understand what's going on inside the, the, the first box. And we've made the mistake, I think, of then trying to address the symptom. It's a little bit like you know, trying to treat the pus right, with, you know, instead of the infection that's going on inside the wound. Uh, and we've done it in other diseases, by the way. We, we, you know, the history of medicine is right with uh, episodes of treating the, the, the end uh, presentation rather than the underlying disease. I mean, you know, think about tuberculosis. So we need to understand multimorbidity, what it is, and then how to cope with it. We need to develop a system, a new system of primary care that is truly cost effective. There are a lot of demonstrations out there how to give comprehensive primary care. Very few of them turn out to be cost effective. And so they're very hard to sell. They're very hard to replicate. I believe that the heart of this is what I would call proactive primary care that is capable of addressing multimorbidity. It's changing in the way I just described this whole emphasis from a reactive primary care system to a proactive primary care system that follows patients' situations and intervenes in a timely way rather than just doing it on some sort of time-driven basis. I think we need to be able to demonstrate cost-effective community care uh, and to demonstrate that the benefits of good care are truly important to patients and to their families and to, and to the population as a whole. And we need to find ways to reduce caregiver burden by providing appropriate assistance and support. <coughs> now, but what does that really mean? Well, it means looking at, at, at long-term care and recognizing that good long-term care involves more than just function. It means that older people have the right to age with dignity and choice, to get help in the way that maximizes their autonomy that supports their individuality and their independence. And we need to take this as, as a mantra and really begin to demonstrate that if we did this, we would then have a concept that people could support because it had a positive valence, not just a low negative valence. And reducing something from sort of crum from very crummy to crummy isn't exactly a big victory. You need to put a positive valence on this and show that by doing this, you actually have a positive effect on the lives of older people. This is going to require the development of new measures that basically reflect these quality of life goals. And it's going to require establishing systems that can show you know, that uh, the caregivers, to demonstrate to the caregivers the difference that they're making. One of the problems that we have in this caregiving business for professionals and non-professionals alike is every day they wake up, and they go out and do their job, and what do they see? They see their clients getting worse. I mean, success in the area of chronic disease and long-term care is rarely measured by improvement. It's measured by slowing the rate of decline. Now, this is a very important concept, because if we're ever going to be able to show the workers who then basically can get a greater sense of satisfaction out of the work that they're giving because they can see the difference that their care makes. Or well, we're going to show society why it's worth investing in this kind of care. We need to develop a management, a, a measurement strategy that really allows us to show the benefit that good care makes. Now the problem with, with that is that if you look at 
you know, what happens if you have somebody going out and doing a good job, what they are doing is slowing this rate of decline. So we think of this as any outcome you want on one axis and time on the other axis. And you, know, you get this blue line, which is actually a successful care. But it's, you can't tell it's successful care unless you have a point of comparison. And we don't have the capacity today to readily demonstrate the difference between those, that green and that blue line, which is in fact the, the, the true measure of the impact of this kind of care. And that's going to require information systems which are able to you know, basically you know, develop you know, what we would think of as control groups. That would show you what happens in the absence of Well, you're not giving this care, this would show you the difference that you're making. If you had this kind of information, you could develop a much more satisfied workforce, because they would recognize the value of their contributions. You would develop a more enthusiastic populace who would be willing to invest in this kind of care, and at least in some places, you might even get a motivated politician. That's sort of an oxymoron, I recognize, but um, nonetheless, it, it has been known to happen once in a while. And I think that this is the, the, the future toward which we really want to strive. And to do this, it really is going to require the active interface of people like yourself giving care, and researchers and academicians who can really develop this information structure to both support the system in giving better care and, e and equally importantly measure the difference that good care makes in order to provide the ammunition to do the kind of political and social battling that it's going to take to face the kinds of realities that we're going to be dealing with. So I'll leave that to my colleagues to figure out how to do it. Thank you.